you came into the studio and, and, and came and chatted a little bit. I want to go back a little, back a bit more, because you were in the police, in the security police. How did you end up there pre-1994? I mean, what, what, what drew you into doing that kind of work? Um, Alec, thank you, first of all, for, um, for having me, and thank you to all of you for, for staying up. I've no idea why you wouldn't be in your bed by now, but thank you for not being there. So the question that you ask is, how did I land up in the police and how did I land up in, in the security? Well, well, just yeah, just go back a little bit. Sure. Not everybody wants to become a cop. No, exactly, especially not an English-speaking uh, matric guy in the apartheid era. It was not normal. And um, my dad, like you, was a journalist. I was raised by a single parent and it wasn't my mom. My dad raised us on a journalist's um, salary and he kind of understood a little bit of the cultural, social, or political context that I was going into when I left high school in 1981 and went to go and, under, and do a year's worth of police training in the Pretoria Police College, um, which was a predominantly Afrikaans environment. And he was right, because when I got to Bravo uh, Company Platoon 7, there were 36 men in a bungalow and four of us were English-speaking. I don't know how, Alec, um, I've never tried to find out, but I don't know how the security police found out that there was this English-speaking kid um, from Joburg at Parkview Police Station, and they came recruiting, and I landed up. Uh, first of all, there was an inv a special investigation unit formed that was not a security police unit, and cops were seconded to, the, to this uh, because P.W. Boerter had declared the second state of emergency and they needed investigators to interrogate a lot of the um, activists and um, I was listening with interest to Helen Zilla this morning because those organizations that she mentioned like the, the end conscription campaign, the UDF, those were our customers. Was she, was she on your list? Now, you, <laughs> 1981, yeah. I'm sure my phone was tapped. No, well, I, I could almost, and I could, or, you know, you'd listen I, and you'd get some. I was Lynn Matrick. <laughs> okay, okay, it wasn't you then. Yeah. All right, okay. Because yeah. 81, so when was it that you started tapping phones? Um, 86. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, you don't know about my phone? No. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> but I, but I, I will tell you a, a, a brilliant story, Alec, that I don't think you can tell the story in any other country in the world. Because when I was recruited as a very young, very green, wet behind the ears warrant officer into the, into the church's section of the security police in, in John Forster Square, my commander, as my induction almost into what the security branch does, said, you go up to the 11th floor, which was where the technical department was, where all the bugged phones happened. So my job was to arrive at work in the morning, go upstairs and fetch those old reel-to-reel -reel tapes of the phones that were bugged. And my um, suspect was a lady called Mary Mkadana, who was the secretary to the general secretary of the South African Council of Churches, Dr. Wolfram Kistner. So I would sit with these big headphones on with these tapes spinning, and my instruction from my commander was, Make a note of anything subversive that you hear on this, on this bugged phone. No training, no guidance, just make notes. I couldn't understand 70% of it because the conversations were either in Sesotho or Zulu. But the English part, you know, from what I thought sounded subversive, I reported that up the line. Imagine my surprise. So that's 86. Imagine my surprise in 1996, 10 years later. Is that right? Ten years later, I get to the Presidential Protection Unit as a team leader, and my colleague Jason Chabalala says, Rory, won't you just go down to um, the, P the PA's office and go and get the program for the president for the next week? I walk in there. Who's the president's PA? Sis Mary. Oh. Miriam Kladana. <laughs> and she says, would you like some tea? I said, I would love a cup of tea. She, you know, she's printing the program while the, we're waiting for the document to arrive. I said to Mary, I've got to tell you something. I said, you don't know this, but I used to, I was a security branch cop, and I listened to your telephone that we bugged. And thinking, you know, what's going to happen? And she threw back her head, and she just roared with laughter. And I said to her, where else in the world can two people have this conversation? You know, yeah, we're both serving now the, you know, the, the 
most famous human being on the planet, and um, I bugged her phone. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. Mary, yeah, Mary, special yeah. She's, lady. She's no longer with us. Is she? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so how did you then move from, well, before we go there, when I was listening to our interview, you said the churches section. Yes. You, you presumably weren't a choir boy or... No, no, well, I, I, I was then and I still am a, um, a, an, an, an active Christian in, in, in my church, and maybe that's what the security branch knew, and that's maybe why they recruited me. I don't know, Alec. But this, the reason that the security police had a church's section was because a lot of the funding for the anti-apartheid organizations, such as the UDF, was funneled from overseas via the churches and via the South African Council of Churches, in particular in Khotso House, which is why the security branch blew up Khotso House um, in the early 1990s. That's why they targeted it. Yeah, so the, it, was a, it was a conduit for anti-apartheid funding the churches, and that's what the security police concentrated on. And what was the job? As I said to you, we, um, so the job of the security branch overall was to gather intel on anybody who acted in any form or manner or was a member of any organization that acted in any form or manner against the state. That's what we did. And of course, out of that came, you know, a, a litany of um, of quite serious human rights abuses that all surfaced in the in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as we know. Yeah. Okay, so we get the background. Here's this English-speaking guy who gets put into a bungalow of of mostly Buddha. Yeah. Um, he's in the police. Yeah. Uh, he he then goes into the security branch because he's a Christian. He goes into the church's section, which is the conduit for money that comes through. And not long after that, we have. Massive transformation in South Africa. How did you feel about that? Uh, I didn't agree with it. You know, perhaps my um, perhaps my training, first and foremost as a police officer, and second of all as a security branch police officer, was that I drank the Kool Aid. I'm happy to admit that I bought into the um, you know the racial or the ideology of a um, you know of a a, a, a divided South Africa was probably better, and I had no reason to think that you know that 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 trying to build one South Africa and uniting your peoples was a good idea. Um, I you get people now you can't as somebody said the other night you can't find anybody who voted for the Nats. Well, here's one, you know. So yeah, yeah. So how did that that transition occur? That you come from this background that you've now described very openly and honestly with us to being put next to the president and the, uh, the icon, as you say, and the, surely at the time, sure. there must have been quite a few people who, who didn't want Mandela to live very long. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I, th I was one who, who's, you know, who actually said with these lips, I probably said, you know, they should have hanged him in 1964 because he was a terrorist. That's, that's how I was trained and that's what I believed. I can't deny that now, sitting here in 2022. But to answer your question, how did it happen? Very simply, four years after this um, church's section thing, F.W. de Klerk makes that famous historical announcement on the 2nd of February. And on the 11th of February, President Mandela walks out of prison as a free man. And all of those organizations and persons that were our focus are no longer illegal. They are legal and they are organizations and legal people and therefore the, the powers that be at the security branch decided to, to do two things. One, they changed the name of the unit. So it was no longer called the security branch, it was called uh, thereafter the crime intelligence service because the thinking was if we can put the same amount of effort with the same amount of success into fighting crime as we did to fighting anti-apartheid organizations then that's, that's a unit worth having and sadly we know what's happened to the Crime Intelligence Service. It's become a compromised unit that really serves um, the governing elite and doesn't serve our um, intelligence uh, needs and, 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 um, and requirements. And the second thing that happened is they didn't know what to do with me. What are we going to do with this young lieutenant? Because by then I was a lieutenant by 1990. Very young, very inexperienced lieutenant. They said, Stan, you go and start the VIP protection unit. 
So I did. And um, you would appreciate, Alec, that prior to that announcement in 1990, the National Party, and in particular its Prime Minister or President, was completely anathema to the diplomatic community and the business community. From that day onwards, they were flavor of the month, and everybody wanted a piece of FW and his Nats. What are they going to do? What is the policy going to look like? Where are they going to take the country? So FW was the, 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 the state president at the time, who very rarely came to Joburg, if ever. But now remember, I'm the commander of the police VIP protection unit in Joburg. And I now have the state president who's being courted, and he's coming to Joburg quite often. But he detested security. Because think about who his predecessors were, Forster and um, PW. One was Minister of Defense, the other Minister of Police. They were secured crats to, their, to the soles of their feet, and he wanted to break that mold. So he didn't want to see cops around him. So we had to be very discreet. All of a sudden, fast forward the movie now, four years, to 94, when Madiba becomes president. I've now got a president who lives and has an office in Joburg where I'm the commander of the VIP unit. So I end up spending 75% of my working day doing what we in the trade call advanced security, which means we would go in advance to whatever venue he's going to be at, whether it's a black tie dinner or a breakfast or a meeting, and we would secure that venue bring the sniffer dogs through there, post my men and women at the entrances and exits and await his arrival. Until in January of 96, the phone rings. It's the commander of what was by then the presidential protection unit. There was no such thing in 94. It evolved over time. The, and the voice on the phone says, uh, Rory, it's, it's, it's Colonel um, Jacobs. One of the team leaders is emigrating to Canada. He's going to go and study there. You are the same rank. You know the president, he knows you. You know the teams, they know you. Would you consider applying for that position as team leader? So I said, well, give me 24 hours. I need to consult the government at home. And I said to my wife, you know, do I do this? And she says, yeah, I think you should take it. So I phoned him back the next day and said, okay, I'm in. And I transferred from Joburg to the presidential protection unit and I was appointed as his team leader. But you weren't ANC. No. Anything but it. No. I've... I, I, I grew to love Madiba. I miss him every single day. He was brilliant towards us, but I could not identify with his party because I don't, and I don't like the fact that we, ha, and I'm not a politician, Alec, please understand that I'm not, but I don't like the fact that we almost live in a socialist country today, as, as uh, one of our speakers this morning was saying. We do. We live in a socialist country, and I will never vote for that. Yeah. When did you first meet him? On the day he became president. Great story. As the commander of the VIP unit in Joburg, our job was to secure the, the five-star hotels for the 184 heads of state, heads of government, and royalty who came to Madiba's inauguration. It was a massive international event. And there were no five-star hotels in Pretoria. So all of those people stayed in Joburg, and their motorcades had to get them up the M1 on that day, which was the 10th of May 1994, when Madiba swore the oath of office before the Chief Justice. And we saw the helicopters flying with those huge, big ceremonial flags and all of those images that are kind of part of our, our life in South Africa. I get a telex from head office to say that the newly inaugurated president, after swearing the oath of office, will fly on one of those helicopters to Ellis Park in Joburg and attend a soccer match where Bafana Bafana are playing Chipolo Polo, Zambia, the reigning African Cup of Nations champions. Because somebody very wise on the inauguration committee decided if we put 60,000 soccer fans into Ellis Park, then that, and we televise the inauguration on the big screens in the stadium, then that is 60,000 fewer people traveling up the M1 where I've got to move these 184 motorcades. <laughs> and more importantly, 60,000 fewer people trying to cram onto the lawns of the union buildings where this massive celebration is happening because this is truly the culmination of the struggle. 
democracy has dawned, freedom has come to the majority of our people, and they're having a party on the lawns of the union buildings. And that's all being televised, by the way. So I get this telex and I think, you know, nobody's given me any new instructions. I'm still the commander of the VIP unit. I better go to Ellis Park and do for Madiba, who I've never met, what I would have done had de Klerk been coming to a rugby match there. So I go, sniff the dogs, check the president's suite, post my men and women, helicopter lands on the roof of the Technicon next door and the motorcade drives him around the corner. Up the ramp and across this parquet floor with the tires all squeaking now over the polished floor. And a motorcade pulls up outside the president's suite. The SAFA officials are standing there, I'm standing there. They welcome the president. He doesn't go into the president's suite, he goes straight to the lift because he was supposed to arrive before kickoff. It's now half time. And I think the teams are even waiting for half time. He goes down to the dressing room level and he walks out of the tunnel as he did a year later in, on that famous day. And that crowd that have just watched him swear the oath of office are going absolutely berserk, as crazy as the crowd on the lawns of the union buildings. Here he is in front of them in their presence. He greets the teams, you know, as presidents do. By the way, the score was nil-nil at half time. He walks back into the tunnel, gets in the lift, comes back out there and immediately apologizes to the software officials. He says, guys, I've got to get back to Pretoria. I've got 184 of the world's big shot VIPs waiting for me to host them for lunch. I'm now the president. And by then the score was 2-0. So I don't know what he said, <laughs> but it was 2-0 in the five minutes it took him to get back up the lift. I take a step back as he's in the car breathe literally and figuratively a, a sigh of relief because I didn't know what to expect. I'd never worked with a predominantly black football crowd. I'd never worked with Nelson Mandela as my protectee. And I didn't know whether we had done enough. And nothing happened. He's safe, he's in the car, and he's going to go back to the helipad. And as I say, I take a step back, and nothing happens. The car doesn't move. And we see him trying to get the door open. But he's just got in. So the team leader from the ANC protection detail calls the bodyguard in the car and says, hey, why does he want to get out? That oak says, I don't know. He hasn't said anything. Now, Alec, it's a 3.8 ton armored BMW. When you're in your late 70s, you can't just flick an elbow and the BMW's door opens. You need a team leader to give it a good sharp tug. So the team leader does that. And he leans in. And in an almost impatient fashion says, Dada, why do you want to get out? He doesn't quite say you've just got in, you know, because that would be rude. The president says nothing to the team leader. He gets out the way, the old man climbs out the car. And he walks around the bonnet of this BMW and he starts walking across this polished wooden floor to the vehicle ramp where he should be driving out. And the only person standing there, the back of this hall, is an old school apartheid era Policy colonel. In his full blue uniform, he's got his stars and castles here on his shoulders to show his rank. He's got some scrambled egg on his cap. And the president is walking directly towards him. And he's got no idea why. And his eyes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And he's thinking, why is he coming to me? And we, as the bodyguard, a few cops and a few security guys, is maybe 10 of us, maximum 12 of us, are just tagging along because we've got no idea why he's going over there. And the president stops in front of this colonel and he puts out his hand and he says to him, Colonel, I just want to tell you that today you have become our police. He said, I'm now the president of this country, but I want you to know that from today forward, there's no more you and us. You are now our police. And this old warrior very near the end of his career, clearly. And he had the lines on his face to show that he'd pretty much seen and done it all through those apartheid years. And he started crying. And the tears were running down those lines on his face, and they were dripping like this onto that polished parquet wooden floor. And the old man just patted him on the shoulder and said, It's okay, Colonel. I just wanted you to hear that from me. He turned on his heel, he walked back to the BMW, he got in, he said, Let's go to the helipad. Now, 
There's a few things there, Alec. I know you want to move on, but mm -hmm. I just want to say, mm -hmm. there's a few things that that said to me. First of all, if you'd punched me on the nose, I would have been less surprised than what I heard him say to my colleague. Th this wasn't a media moment. He was already the president. He wasn't trying to win votes here. It said that 184 of the world's most famous VIPs can just wait a few more minutes because that colonel needs to hear this message from me today. So on the day he became president, he started with this agenda of his of, of nation building and reconciliation. And this cynical cop who didn't believe a word he said four years earlier when he was released from prison, when he went to the Grand Parade in Cape Town to make his first speech as a free man, and he said, South Africa is for all her people, quoting from the Freedom Charter. South Africa is for all her people, both black and white. I'm going, yeah, whatever. Of course you're going to say that, man. That's the party line. I didn't believe it until I heard four years later him tell my colleague that. It, it took all the wind out of my sails and knocked my feet from under me, literally and figuratively, Alec. And that's the day that I started to question all of my upbringing. I was 33 or 4 years old at that time on that day. And I started to ask myself, Rory, have you not been wrong all these years? And I, for one, decided from that day forward, because I watched him, that was the start of it, I then watched him for a matter of two, three months, every day, up close and personal. I watched him say the same thing, consistent, do the same things. And I watched him change our nation, and he changed me. And I said, okay, I'm going to give this man a chance. I'm going to give this thing called nation building and this new South African concept. I'll give it a chance. And I bought into it, hook, line, and sinker. And I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed to say that because um, I had this privileged viewpoint from which I saw that this was not a facade. It wasn't a political or a party line. None of that. It was genuine. What about kids? We know that Madiba loved children. <laughs> now, if, was, it, was it easy to, uh, well, if he... Just, just tell us a little bit about when he saw kids. Uh, if he does that with a colonel, I guess if there were children around, Listen, it must make Eric, it very difficult that, for you. That, that colonel thing was nothing. He, if he saw kids, we knew 100% he's going to go there, and he's going to talk to them, and he's going to sing with them. Not to them, with them. He'll, and he will normally sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. He'll get them singing. In this high-pitched, kind of quavering, slightly quavering voice, he'll sing to them. And we would know this, so we would send our men and women there and say, guys, if the president comes here, if, if the president comes here, don't all rush. Wait your turn. He's going to greet every single one of you. He's probably going to sing with you. That's fine. But just don't all rush and don't jump on him and don't hug him because then we're going to pull you off. And we would do this. That's, we had to adapt our protection philosophy uh, uh, because we knew he would go to kids. He would always go to kids. He just loved children. And I'm I'm proud to say that I served a president that loved children and that loved working, walking and just being with ordinary South Africans. He loved nothing more than to push the formal agenda aside and just go and do something. I mean, he was in jail for 27 years. Of course he wanted to be with people. So when he was courting Mama Grasa, for example, Mrs. Michelle, he would want to go and buy her the chocolates. He would want to buy her flowers. He would want to buy her he, jewelry. How did he do that? Can you imagine what happens when Nelson Mandela walks into <laughs> Santon City to go and buy chocolates? <laughs> then it's our problem, you know? <laughs> and it was, it was uh, but as I say again, I, I'm very proud of the fact but, that but I... But no, tell us, what, that what that happened? No, what it, it, he walks into Santon City <laughs> and, and there are just people obviously trying to mob him. And, th and that was the days before social media. So, so the best people had was an SMS. But all of a sudden, like wildfire, the whole of Santon City knew that Madiba is in Godiva Chocolatier, or he's in this florist, or he's in the CNA. One day he went to buy, he, he says, I want to go and buy a book. I said, no problem, Dada, give us the money, we'll go and get the book. No, I want to trust it myself. <laughs> so now we go into the CNA. And within seconds, the entire CNA is overrun with everybody who is in Santon City. So I tell the guys, close the doors. So our guys start closing the sliding doors, and he says, Rare, man, tell your people, we mustn't close the doors. I said, Dada, they're going to steal all the books. Oh, okay, close the doors. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> it it sounds to me like he didn't really take himself that seriously. He's he, I, I remember reading Time magazine after he died, saying that he's that most rare of species, a mature human being. So, you know, it wasn't my place to to comment on that sort of thing, Alec. But I'm often asked what he was like. And the greatest compliment I can pay Nelson Mandela is to tell all of you, I don't know how many of you met him, I had the privilege of meeting him, but everybody wanted to, and most people didn't, so they ask. And I can say this, that how you perceive him off a, f off a TV screen, that's how he was. He, were, he had that rare quality or ability to be able to treat everybody the same. Again, utterly consistent, whether he was speaking to another head of state or to the gardener or to his family or to us. He treated everybody equally. He would go to a black, I mentioned this, he would go to a black tie function. Let's say the Sant and Sun, 600 people sit down in a black tie. You always have a, what we call a holding room, where if he needs a one-on-one -on -one with somebody, he can go into a holding room. And you always have a little... Um, a smaller room where the host will will host the president until all the guests are seated. And then the master of ceremonies will indicate, okay, we're ready, and then we'll go in. He would not leave that room until he had greeted the waiter and the waitress who were serving the canapes and the drinks to all of those big shots in there. Why? Because it's just who he was. I don't think he was trying to, to, to do it again because of any particular agenda or to show he was a good guy, he just genuinely, the waiter was as important as his host, in his view. Everybody has a place in the sun here. Rory, you said a bit earlier that he changed your life, yeah. and that you think about him every day. How did he change your life, and what do you think about when you think about him daily? Okay, so I've, I've, I've tried to explain how he changed my life, because he changed my thinking, because I I, I believe, first of all, that he was a terrorist, that they, that they, they should have hanged him, not sent him to life imprisonment. That's, that's wh what I thought. But that was your thought. That wasn't yeah. your life. But No, exactly. And then I got to meet him. Then I got to see the things that he was doing, and I got to um, hear the things that he, w that he was saying, and I got to understand that he's actually 100% committed to and genuine and sincere about building one South Africa. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? You think about him every day. Oh, How? I think, I think about him every day because of the lessons that I learned from him that I now try and teach my sons. He had fantastic manners. He would never walk past a lady without greeting her. He would stand up if a woman walked into the room and he was sitting down. He had those Victorian manners. He would go to the children. He would, he would thank people. And he was sincere about it. One day... Alec, we arrived at the Union Buildings. So we had to, he lived in Houghton, in his own home, not in the, uh, in the official residence in Pretoria. So we had to drive up that M1 every day. And one day, it must have been school holidays, and we caught every robot green, and we got there at like 10 to 7 in the morning. Business hours in the government service are 7.30 to 4. So we tried to get there quarter past seven in the morning. We must have got there ten to. The place was a ghost town. There's nobody in the union buildings. And we had this private drop-off on the northern side of the of the union building where you come through an archway into a big courtyard and then you go up the stairs or the escalator or the lift to the floor where his office is. And as we walk through this archway into the union buildings, there's a cleaning lady on her hands and knees polishing the stoop with cobra wax. And he literally kind of almost you know, walks into her backside. And so do we, and we all stop. And he looks down at her, and he says, yes, mama. And she hears that voice. She gets a fright. She tries to stand. She tries to clean her hand all at the same time. And he just says, no, 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 mama, it's okay. Just stay there. Now she's like kneeling at attention there, you know. <laughs> and he says, what's your name? Where do you come from? Where do your parents come from? How long have you worked here? And thank you for keeping our office so clean. And then he went around her, and he went to his office. 
And I've never forgotten that moment or that lesson, Alec. Because today, I mean, here we sit with very influential business leaders. And maybe there's a chairman of the board, for example, I don't know, anybody, walked in, who walks into his office and when the tea lady greets him and says, good morning, sir, he doesn't have the decency to... I think nothing of such a person. Because if Nelson Mandela can stop and greet the tea lady, uh, no, sorry, the cleaning lady on her all fours with a dirty rag and cobra wax, who are you, sir, to not return the greeting of the tea lady in your own office? I, I've never forgotten that, that, that lesson. And it's things like that that showed me that this is an extraordinary person, human being. Was there anybody who didn't like him? Anybody who was arrogant in his presence? Louis Late. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, not was he, were they, I mean, were they like sparks when they no, were I, together? You no, know, I can't say. I did go to court with him that day that he was, and he was just so thoroughly uncomfortable not wanting to be there, but for the sake of the fact that the court had summonsed him and the importance of the rule of law to him, he went. And I, again, I have to admire that. I can only admire that because it was, it was humiliating. It was, it was demeaning, but he went because of, he had to set the example. That's, what he, that's, how, that's how he saw it. So I, that was a tongue-in-cheek statement. I, I honestly don't know of too many people who... Um, you know, who didn't like him, but he tells, he, he, had, he, he loved telling stories. And again, he would push the, uh, f the formal speech aside and then start telling stories, and then we would listen. So he tells this great story. He says he's, he's somewhere, I think he was on his, on his farm in Kuno, and a young girl came in there, eight or nine years old, and she said to him, um, how old are you? This is Namadi telling the story. So he says to the girl, no, I don't know, I, c I can't remember, but I'm quite old. And uh, she says, why did they send you to prison? And he says, no, some people didn't like me, you know, so they, so they sent me to, to, to prison. And, he, and she says, and how long were you in prison? And he says, no, I can't remember, but it was quite long. And Madiba says, and then she looked at me and she said, you are a stupid old man. Because <laughs> he couldn't answer any of her questions. <laughs> I, I, I'm quite interested about how people changed in his presence and before. You mentioned earlier, uh, it, and, it, and it is a truism, you can often judge people by the way that they treat those who are, in their opinions, in lesser, lesser stations yes. than they are, um, than they happen to occupy. Did you see any of that during your time? Did you see people being real shithouses on the one side, but the minute Madiba came in, of course, they were sweet as candy? Always. You're always going to get that. And you're going to get that in any environment, not just with Madiba. I mean, I, as I said, I was the commander of the VIP unit. So I worked with a lot of VIPs and ministers. And you get these, um, these uh, staff members who think that they're the minister and behave as if they are, and they throw the minister says this or the president wants it like that, and they don't. They're just trying to get their way and trying to, to you know, to be very... And we just used to say to those people, hey, just remember if the bullets fly here, we're pushing you in front of those guns. So best you not behave like that. <laughs> you know? yeah. And bribery, were there any attempts? In, in what sense? Well, we know nowadays... Mm -hmm. uh, I'll maybe give you a little story from a uh, business people, a, a chairman of a major company in the UK that I met, said he came out to South Africa. He, he met with Zuma, all happy. He met with a minister that he was supposed to have spoken to, all happy. And as he was departing, uh, the two people who were showing him around said, well, that's going to be f half a million dollars to do the transaction you were talking about, the investment you were going to do. And he, he had no reason to, to lie to me at that point, excepting to say that's why they didn't invest in South yeah. Africa. Did you, get any, did you get a smell of anything, any attempts like that? No. I, ca I, can, I can say hand on heart, I, I, I was never privy to anything like that. Other than in Madiba's last year in office, so that would be late um, 98 up leading into 99 because he handed over the reins of the country to President Mbeki on the, seven, the 16th of June 99. And in that last year, uh, the deputy president 
um, Thabo Mbeki was pretty much running the country and Madiba was more or less a figurehead and he was trying to tie up some of the kind of programs, initiatives, agendas that he was doing, especially on an international basis. For example, the conflict in the Great Lakes that he was trying to resolve and get uh, Kabila out of power and you know bring peace where there, where, where there was uh, that kind of conflict. He was also in, involved with President Mary Robinson in Ireland on some of those initiatives. But what he did in that last day, and I mean, um, I didn't see it as bribery, but what he did, he was very, very clever. Um, he instructed his, his secretaries to call up the CEOs of like the top 30 companies. And he would, this was his strategy. He would invite them for breakfast and he would say, bring your wives. And then this gentleman and his wife would come for breakfast at Houghton very early in the morning, seven o'clock. And Madiba was a great raconteur, very good storyteller, and a wonderful host. And he would host them for breakfast. And then at the end of the breakfast, he would say, now, uh, the reason I called you here was that I need to build a clinic in some rural village, or I need to build a school in that rural village. Now, which CEO in front of his wife, having just been regaled and entertained by Nelson Mandela, is going to say no? <laughs> and so they would... They would you know, come up with the, with the three or five million rand or whatever it took to build the village. But it was never for him. It was always for a community of people where they needed a school or a clinic. So, you know, maybe it could possibly be argued that that was, you know, um, that gave license to certain people to go further than that. I don't know. But I can tell you that when that clinic or that school was built, he brought that same CEO with his wife and flew him down there and they opened the clinic and cut the ribbon together, you know. So that guy got his mileage for his company, no question. Yeah. Enormous amount of good. If you're in, in prison for 27 years, you don't eat great food. Uh, I did notice that the, the one evening that I was, I did have dinner, um, and everybody else got five-star meals, and he had literally samp, and I think it, yeah. 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 it was that the way he used to eat ordinary? Especially towards the end, Alec, again, I wasn't privy to all of it, but I know that um, you know, the doctors and uh, the medical people that, that looked after his health would have said to him that you know, he needs to follow this diet rather than that. But he loved simple isikosa food. He l so th so when, we were, when we were on the farm in Kuno, and they slaughtered a sheep, I mean, there they slaughter the sheep, yeah, they light the fire, yeah, and they cook it in the fire. And then they bring him the cheek, that tender meat from the cheek and the tongue of the sheep, because that's what you, that's what you give to the elders. You, get, you give them the, you know, the, the best cuts of meat. And it was that, so he ate red meat, so he would eat gusha, which is um, the also word for a, for a sheep, and he would eat umnushu, he would eat um, vegetables, and if he had wine, it was a little bit of dessert wine. You know, he lived a very healthy, very frugal lifestyle. He didn't need anything. Alec, that's the great thing about him. As I said to you, as you perceive him, that's how he is. He, he had something like, I've, last count was 184 honorary doctorates from universities around the world. He didn't need any of that. He didn't need the world's accolades and this award and that award. I mean, he took the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, it was, uh, I think it was $150,000. He gave that entire block of money and started the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. And then he donated a third of his salary every month to that fund. He didn't need that stuff. He, if he was happy, he was just happy to be able to read his newspapers every day. And he read every single newspaper, English and Afrikaans, cover to cover every day. Ever curse at the stuff that he saw? No, but he would sometimes call us to explain some, you know, like an Afrikaans phrase or something. You know, what does this mean? Yeah, and then we Did you travel with him? Yeah. Everywhere. What do you mean, man? I Around the world. I slept in Buckingham Palace for three nights. <laughs> Ladies, eat your hearts out. I slept in Buckingham Palace, okay? <laughs> yeah. Was it more dangerous abroad? Uh, no, I wouldn't think so. Um, and, and, and my world works like this, Alec, that when, when we go abroad with the president, we go there with the knowledge that that country's security forces are in charge. I mean, they're a sovereign state. They are in charge of his security and of national security. But they've got to understand that we work with him every day. So they need to be asking us, you know, what he prefers, what he likes, what he doesn't like. And more importantly, 
when they come to our country, then the shoe's on the other foot, then we're in charge. So best you treat us well and we'll treat you well. Isandla zea gezana. One hand washes the other. So that's, the, uh, that's a world of reciprocity. Yeah. So it was five years. Yes. Was there ever a danger? Ever? Yeah. Yeah, there were. There were. And you know what? The, probably the biggest eye-opener to me, even though I had a, an intelligence background from my, my few years spent in the security branch, was that from within his own party, there, was, there were threats. And insider threats are the, are the gravest threats. Because there were a lot of people that were unhappy with or disgruntled with their lot. So maybe a guy coming out of Umkonto where sees where that should have been a general and didn't become a general, now bore a grudge. And we would often receive such um, reports. Then, of course, you've got the nutcases. You know, they're just unhinged, mental, mental health problem people. And then, of course, you had the, you know, the, the right wing. But I'll tell you another story. When, <coughs> when um, the ANC was electioneering to elect President Mbeki, obviously Madiba was like the cheerleader of that election campaign. So it must have been early 1999, and we were in Togoza or Fosleris on the East Rand, which you, you know from, the, from the, the bad days, was a high conflict zone bef between the IFP with their, with their red bandanas, those kopduka on their heads, and the ANC. I mean, they killed each other in those townships. And we were going from house to house to house, you know, with the local councillor, and he'd set up various houses to visit. And we came around a corner, and there was an open piece of felt on the corner. And as we came around that corner, there was an Inkata impi coming, about 50 or 60 of them, with those kopduka on, with their traditional weapons. And they saw us, and we saw them at the same time. And that Induna gave one command, and that whole impi just squatted there, you know, as disciplined as they are, on the ground, in the dust, on that open piece of felt. And Madiba literally pushed us aside. <coughs> Pardon me, the guys that were in front of him. And he went into the middle of that impi. And he said to them, and I paraphrase, something along the lines of, guys, we can be enemies at the pole the polling booth and at the ballot box but we don't have to be killing one another and he gave this little speech to them and they sat there in dead silence and listened to what he had to say and then we went on our way to the next shack that we visited or whatever we went back home now when we get back at the end of our day my job is to go into the house with him and from my pocket I'll take the program the one that I got from sis Mary and brief him on what tomorrow looks like and what time we're starting and all that. While my team, can I get some water please? My men and women are looking, are, 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 are booking the weapons back and uh, sorting out the, the, thanks mate, that's fine, thank you. Excuse me. Thanks Bruce. Thank you. So my, my team will be sorting out vehicles and weapons. I'll then come out and brief them on what I've just told the president and then we'll all go home. I get into that briefing and my, my second in command was an ANC captain. He's also no longer with us, uh, a Zulu from Kwamashu. And Salbi says to me, Rory, this thing of the president pushing us out of the way in the middle of that impi is unacceptable. He cannot be seen to be pushing his bodyguards out of the way. And you need to go and tell him this. So I said, okay, no time like the present. So I said, you, you oaks wait here. I go back in, knock on the door. He's reading his newspapers in the lounge. I said, Tata, can I see you? He says, yeah, come. And I tell him what I've just told you. He looks at me. No, he says, uh, you know, Selby is correct. I should not behave like that. I have to respect the job that you are here to do. And please go back and tell them that I apologize. So yeah, I go, carrying the apology of my president back to my team members to say to them, guys, you know, the, the old man says he's sorry and it won't happen again. But I knew, as sure as the sun's going to rise tomorrow morning, if he got another such opportunity where reconciliation was on the agenda, he would do it again. Because that's, it was very important to him. But he was big enough to say, I'm sorry, and, and please apologize to your, to your team. Rory, we've one last question. Sure. Last year, sorry, 
six months ago, Rob Hersoff was yes. at this conference, and he maintained at in his rather um, uh, aggressive talk, which has been downloaded hundreds of thousands yes. of times, that if Madiba were alive today, he would vote for the DA. Now, you heard what Helen Ziller was talking about uh, earlier, and I think she, she joined a lot of dots, certainly for, for yeah. lots of people. Do you think there's any chance that he would? No. But, uh, and the reason I say no is because he was such a party man. The ANC meant everything to Madiba. So there's no way he would have um, voted for the, for the DA or any other party for that matter. But I'm pretty sure, and again I say I'm not a politician, but I do say that I think that the principles that Madiba held dear, such as non-racialism, South Africa is for all her people, um, resonate, would have resonated such with him such that you could say that what the DA stood for Madiba stood for. And I don't think he would be happy at all, not one bit, with what, had, what, what has become of his party. That's just my view. Um, but I don't think he would ever not have voted, um, voted ANC now. And when did you leave? When did you actually decide to leave the employer? The same day that he did. So as I said, he handed over the reins of our country to President Mbegi at a black tie function on Church Square on the 16th of June, 1999, and I walked into the Presidential Protection Unit on the 17th of June, 1999, and resigned from the cops. And at that stage, Alec, um, there was a complete freeze throughout the civil service on, um, re on re uh, re retrenchment packages. So you could resign, and then all you got was whatever your pension contribution was, plus I think 2%, but you couldn't get that package, that whole retrenchment package because too many people were taking it but I knew that Madiba had written to Sidney Mufamadi who was then the Minister of Safety and Security to say approve Stain's package if he applies so I went in there and I said guys I'm, 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 I want to resign but I want to apply for the package and this clerk said, well, you know you, you're not going to get the package. I said, yeah, no, I'm, I'm well aware of that, but I'm going to apply anyway. And two weeks later, I had my complete. So I'm still on, on Polmed as my medical aid. Uh, that's just one of the benefits of that package, and it's all thanks to him. And, and maybe very briefly, what have you done since? So I left the police on that day and started a security company that I'm still a shareholder of and a director of with, this, with the guy that I started it with, Bob Nichols. So 22 years down the track, or 23 years actually, um, <coughs> excuse me, we must, have been, we must have done something right because we still in business together. Yeah. So that's, that's, your, that's your business and your passion, security. No, well, I'm glad you asked that because it's going to give me the opportunity to say something without you asking the question. So, yes, it's my business. Um, so we're in private security at, at, the, you know, at the, the higher end of the security industry. But it's, it, it isn't what gets me up and out of bed in the morning anymore, um, Alec. I'm 58 years old, <clears throat> and I've come to that part of my life where I feel that I've got to find another way or another channel to, to kind of give back. So I started a charity in 2018 that, that looks after the widows and orphans of cops killed in the line of duty. And I must say that I agree with pretty much everything that Helen Ziller said this morning, particularly about the police having become so, um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, man, beholden to crime and criminal syndicates. But Alec, whatever we think of the police and their behavior, it's not the fault of that little boy or girl if their mom or dad is killed at the hands of a violent criminal. And so our charity looks after, it's called the African Icons Invitational, and it's a cycling charity. That's why I was asking Holgo uh, you know, about riding, cycling this morning. So what we do is we get African icons, iconic sports people predominantly, um, 
we, we've got one coming up on the 12th of March at Stain City where we've got um, OJ Molefe from Supersport. We've got uh, Dingan Tubela, the Rose of Soweto. And John Smith, our World Cup winning captain, was going to ride, but he's got to do a dads and lads camp with his son on that weekend. So I'm going to replace him, I think, with Matthew Booth. But ordinary punters like us that are weekend warriors, we will put some money in to come and ride with icons like that. And that money we just give to the Widow and Orphans Fund and the, the South African Police Service Education Trust so that those kids, you know, are looked after. And that's what gets me up in the morning, more so than just going to work again. I mean, I've been doing, I've been doing policing and security for 40-something years, you know, enough now. <laughs> Not quite. But, um, you know, I'll... Uh, I'm just being honest, that doesn't float my boat as, as it used to. And, um, you know, matters like that or social justice issues are kind of where I think I'm going to be spending the rest of the energy that the good Lord gives me. Rory Stain, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.